Colm, are you ready? Yes. So thank you again, Bob, for putting this together. It's really a wonderful tribute to uh, John. As we all know, he left uh, an indelible mark on numerous and highly varied branches of mathematics, but he did a lot more than that. With his infectious enthusiasm, colorful personality, and disdain for the formal, John became a communicator par excellence, a master of mathematical outreach unparalleled in our lifetimes. He had an unorthodox approach to performance, which endeared him to many. Nobody ever forgot meeting John Conway. As book editor Peter Rentz recently observed, anybody who has sat with John has been touched and changed forever. He had a knack for spotting significance where others saw none. Think of his look and see sequence. He had a genius for simplification, an extraordinary ability to see through a complex idea to its very core. Think of his own take on the monster group, Penrose tiled. And a PMR, he also had a PR man's knack for finding the right words to name things. Why would anybody ever refer to the freeze patterns again by any names other than Conway's, the hop, skip, jump, sidle, and so on? I know Carl Schaefer has just demonstrated that to us. Martin Gardner, who was John Sr. by 23 years, educated many generations about the joys of mathematical thinking through his highly influential writing, leading to over 40 books on maths and puzzles alone despite having no university training in the subject himself. John, by contrast, had an abundance of formal education, became a professional, well, professor. But he also corresponded with Martin for over 50 years, and like Martin, didn't really care what credentials you had, as long as you had something interesting to say. And he provided Martin with some of his most memorable Scientific American material, much of it whimsical, yet also connected to deeper and lasting ideas. He attributed part of his own success in so many different arenas, was habit of always working simultaneously on several unrelated problems on and off. He might be stuck on most of them, but suddenly have an idea leading to a breakthrough on another one. So many people, too many, John thought his greatest hit was the game of life, which was the basis for Martin Gardner's most read scientific American column back in October, 1970. Peter Doyle of Dartmouth College recently remarked, that people invariably describe Conway as the inventor of the game of life. That's like describing Bob Dylan as the author of Blown in the Wind. Well, to that, I would add, trying to name Conway's three or four most important contributions to mathematics is as pointless as trying to identify the three or four best Beatles songs. There's just too many great ones to pick from. When we invited him to Spelman College here in Atlanta, 25 years ago this very week, he predictably lost his plane ticket the night before and emailed me in a panic. All apologies, but no plane ticket. I had to beg our provost to buy him another one. In those days, you needed a paper ticket. I wasn't tenured, and I began to doubt. I began to doubt if I ever would be. Once we did manage to get him to campus, his visit was a runaway success, which included three brilliant lectures and endless tricks and amusements. And yes, he charmed the provost too. His, little, his visit was life-changing for me. It gave me permission to have fun in class as a teacher despite my own very formal education rooted in post-World War II abstraction, an education which included virtually no pictures. John will be remembered largely for the wealth of mathematics he discovered or invented, ranging from recreational to really highbrow. And like Martin Gardner, he not only had the best toys, he shared his toys freely. In about 2013, I was at a dinner with John and Jim Gardner, Mark Mitten and Vicky Kern after a wonderful MoMath event. A famous problem was discussed briefly, invented by Mike Starbird and his brother Tom. We'd all learned it at a gathering for Gardner back in 2010, in the shortest talk I ever attended, when Gary Fauché said the following 20 words, then sat down. I have two children. One is a boy born on a Tuesday. What is the probability I have two boys? I looked across the table and saw Jim Gardner and realized that he had exactly one brother. So I discreetly asked him what his birthday was. And then I turned to John and said, what day of the week was that date? And without hesitation, he said, Wednesday. And then caught himself and said, no, damn, Tuesday. He was a little disappointed that he got it all. But at least you now know how Martin Gardner would have answered that question. The probability in his case would be one. That may have been the last, the last time uh, I had dinner with him. And certainly, I think it's the occasion in which he told me the Fermat would have pronounced the final T in his name given the era and part of France he grew up in. At the 150th anniversary AAAS meeting in Philly, on the 13th of February, 1998, quick, what day of the week was that? 13th of February, 1998. 
once spoke passionately about the importance of triangle geometry, reminding us of Thurston's edict, geometry is the human interface of mathematics. He worked for years in a book all about triangles, first with Atlanta high school teacher, Steve Segur, and more recently with Alex Reba. Alas, that project is currently on pause. John Conway, like Richard Guy, who predeceased him by a month, saw the humble triangle with fresh eyes. A decade ago, he contributed a new proof of Morley's theorem to a ratio of a Martin Gardner book. He once asked, can the ratios of any two sides and angles of a triangle be rational? Conway's little theorem says yes, but only in the obvious case of an equilateral. He also discovered a beautiful theorem about triangles known as Conway's circle. I'm gonna leave you with that. It's a theorem you'll never forget once you hear it, and you need to tell everybody about it, so long as you live, young and old. Actually, the next speaker, Matt Baker, is gonna tell us about that theorem. He's down the road from me here in Atlanta. Thank you. Thank you, Colm. Matt, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Baker. I'm a professor of mathematics at Georgia Tech. Uh, down the road from from Colum, who's at Spelman, and so I've gotten to know uh, John Conway over the years through the gathering uh, for Gardner. Um, but I also uh, had an interesting chat with him when I visited Princeton once to um, give a, a colloquium talk there. I'd been invited by Manjul uh, Bargava, um, who was a close collaborator of Conway's, and. Um, the thing I was speaking about then was something I had come up with um, called the Riemann Rock Theorem for graphs, which is a sort of game, a solitaire game played on a finite graph whose rules imitate a famous theorem in algebraic geometry. And it was something, um, first of all, that I was, I was proud of and that probably impacted my own math career more than anything else. But also it was maybe indirectly really inspired by the kind of mathematics John Conway did because Conway had something he called the vow. Um, I have uh, his biography in front of me here on my Kindle. Um, I just uh, finished reading it actually, so thanks Shabon for writing that. But Con Conway um, in there talks about the vow that he took early in his career after some stumbles where he said, thou shalt stop worrying and feeling guilty, thou shalt do whatever thou pleases. I think he's talking about mathematics there. Um, but uh, that was really the thing that got me, got my career going as well, was coming to that realization for myself. I, I had some struggles in, um, uh, I mean, I got a good job after grad school, but I didn't know who I was as a mathematician. And it was giving my perself, myself permission to play around, experiment, and view uh, puzzles and games as serious mathematics that actually led to one of the breakthroughs that changed my, my career around. So I want to thank John for that. Um, but I went to, uh, I was very eager to explain this result to him at Princeton. And right before my talk, I found him sitting in the lounge, of course, um, at Princeton. And uh, we started to talk about that, but somehow the topic changed to calendar calculations, which I also have loved doing, but I use a different method from the doomsday method. And we ended up talking for two hours about the comparative advantages of uh, different methods for calendar calculations. And um, uh, it was so much fun that I, I forgave him for not wanting to hear about my, my theorem about graphs and games. Um, anyway, I wanted to uh, share my screen for a minute. Um, is this working? Uh, hold on. If not, I have another way to do this. The screen is the screen sharing or no? Uh, it's not sharing yet. No, it's not. Okay. Well, I'll do this a different way. So um, I was just going to talk about very briefly about a blog post I wrote. So if you want more details, you can go to my blog. It's mattbakerblog.com, uh, and I talked about several of Conway's mathematical gems which are not as well known as the game of life, the surreal numbers, the doomsday algorithm, moonshine, and things like that. And um, I wanted to tell you quickly about the one that Colm Mulcahy just talked about, which is um, a theorem about the Conway circle that John Conway discovered. And what's amazing to me is that uh, it's very rare that someone discovers a new theorem in Euclidean geometry that's very basic, very fundamental, could have been discovered by Euclid himself 
or Pythagoras or someone like that. But this one, I believe, was discovered by John Conway. And here's a picture of it because I can't get my screen share to work. Um, so if you can see that, this is actually taken from a math camp t-shirt. As many of you know, John spent a couple of weeks out of every summer uh, teaching kids uh, mathematics at, at a summer camp. And um, this was one of their t-shirts. And so if you can see this, there's a, a blue uh, triangle. You start with any triangle. You extend the sides in six different directions, right? So at each vertex, you take the two natural extensions of the sides. And how far do you go? You go as far as um, the opposite side from that vertex. So from here, you travel at a distance. This distance is equal to the length of that side there, right? So you do that for all uh, six rays coming out of the three vertices. And you get six new points where those rays stop. And John Conway proved that uh, those six points lie on a common circle, which is now known as the Conway circle. And there are many interesting properties, as you might guess. For example, the center of that circle is the in-center of the triangle, the intersection of the three angle bisectors of, of the three angles. Um, so you can read about that and many other uh, amazing things that Conway discovered, but isn't as famous for as the game of life uh, on my blog. And uh, thanks, John Conway. Thanks to the organizers for putting this together. And, um, you know, thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you, Matt. That was a great blog post. Uh, and while I'm at it, Calm, that was a wonderful obituary in The Guardian. Um, next up is Chris Palmer. Are you ready? Yes, hello. Hi. Um, I would uh, like to talk about John as my mentor. Um, and I think the best way to do that would be to talk a little bit about first meeting him and being invited to visit him after a, an art and math conference in, I think, 97. And um, he said, come on down and visit me. And as a young artist with no job and complete freedom, I went down to visit him and, and landed at his um, in the summer when it was uncrowded and spend about a week, week or so with him uh, studying polyhedra and being like getting a, an amazing privilege to kind of take notes while he because when you visited him he was just working on something and you would get swept into it as many many people i'm sure know um and um <clears throat> the the background here is a, a little diagram that i would draw every day we would wake up and he would rearrange it and i would draw a new one and then it had um he was working on a notation for the polyhedra and it became a, a chapter in um, the book that he wrote with Heim and so it's it's fun for me to look at that now many years later and um, and I think the the thing that I'd like to um, hopefully express and um, is how he um, just sitting alongside him as he worked on this gave a sense of a love of tradition and he taught me about Kepler kind of a mentor of his and how Kepler named a polyhedra, and then just the art every day refining how that notation was going to be to name the polyhedra and to use the system that Kepler used and to use how the, how the crystallographers named polyhedra and just his love of the history and who had gone before, but also working on it and jumping in himself and, and seeing it kind of like an eagle from far above and, and just the beauty of that and the pursuit of truth and beauty through elegant names of what these objects were. And it was just so special. And it's, it's just, um, it's, I'm going to miss him. And that was just one of, of course, a lot of anecdotes that I could tell, but, and stories and times spent with him on just a few occasions. I'll, I'll end um, with one, uh, a, a little different picture of something that he helped me write um, a paper, but the, first, the third time that I kind of went and couch surfed in his office, he helped me write a paper. And um, it was about some folding things that I was doing in a, a kind of pattern that would let everything spiral in a, in a tiling. And many, many years later, I discovered that it was about how gears work with each other, um, that that was another way to look at it. And there's an image of that. And I think I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you um, for the organizers and giving me a chance to speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris. 
Uh, Psychotion, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to tell you first about the first time I met John and also the last time I spoke to him a week before he died. The first time was when he came permanently to Princeton from Cambridge and uh, he was sitting in the common room and um, I had just come in from playing tennis and I sat down next to him and I said, I've just seen an amazing thing. I saw a rainbow in the sky, but it wasn't at the usual angle of whatever that is, 23 degrees or so. It was much higher in the sky. And just off the cuff, he gave me a perfect lecture on what rainbows do at an angle and also secondary rainbows and even tertiary rainbows uh, using the idea of refracting inside a raindrop. We became very good friends uh, in the next few years. And, but it wasn't until a few years after I had met him and he'd explained many things to me in astronomy, the classification of Lie groups, the etymology of words, very many things, symmetries of bricks, the brickwork we went around that both the town and the university looking at different brickworks because they of course had to do with symmetry groups. And he even gave a, a talk afterwards to the university on such symmetry groups. And you saw a, a talk on, on uh, stepping the footprints. He tried to induce the uh, president of Princeton uh, at the time who had introduced him to take off of his shoes and socks so that he could uh, do some prints on, on the floor. Uh, unfortunately, the president uh, refused to do that. Anyway, the last time I, I spoke to him was about a week before he died. And... Uh, he was in a care center because of the stroke he'd had a couple of years earlier. And he told me um, he was in very good spirits. And the only thing he complained about was that damned virus, which stopped people from visiting him. And of course it was that damned virus that took his life. I just want to say a few things about my work with him. Um, at some point, I started, I told him about some work I had done much earlier with the uh, mathematician and Specker, something called the Cauchy Specker theorem in quantum mechanics. And he told me he doesn't know very much about quantum mechanics. I said, it really, the basis of this is, a, is a really a, about a three dimensional. Uh, three-dimensional bit of combinatorics in geometry and at that he got picked up his ears and we had gotten a certain 117 directions in which something happens and uh, we worked at, John and I worked on it to try and reduce that number and we finally got it down to 31 31 directions and that's where it stands at the moment uh, that uh, it has never been reduced since then in fact it's known that it, uh, it must be at least 22 directions for this uh, result to happen in any case um, we started working on uh, on quantum mechanics uh, he got interested in, 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 the, in the theory, and um, we ended up with this uh, theorem called the free will theorem. Now, we had a disagreement on it. Uh, it had to do with the response of a particle to uh, looking at uh, measurements of the spin in these 31 directions, or originally 117 directions. And um, actually, the, the result is that the 
particle's response is not a function, is not determined or a single valued function of the past history of the universe. And I wanted to call that its spontaneous direction. And he said, no, no, no. He said, this is the free will of the particle. And I said, well, free will, look. And he said, look, the word spontaneous, he was wonderful when he came to etymology of words. He said, the word spontaneous in Latin just means essentially free will anyway. But the thing to clinch her that made me give in was he said, listen, if you want to call it the spontaneous theorem, go ahead. You'll get two or three physics readers. But if you call it the free will theorem, then you'll get a lot of readers from philosophy and physics and so on. And of course, he was quite right. I want to mention one other thing about his naming. He had these uh, this wonderful things that he would name. Uh, we all know the game of life, the monster group, moonshine, and so on, the 15 theorem, and of course, surreal numbers, which were actually named by the, uh, the spe next speaker, I believe, uh, Knuth. But he, he told me he, he loved that name, surreal, surreal numbers. Anyway, at some point, uh, I came to, to work with him, and he was sitting in his usual enclave, a little enclave in Fine Hall in Princeton, and he was reading about uh, uh, an African country, Burkina Faso, and it had a wonderful, um, a wonderful capital called uh, Ouagadougou. Anyway, uh, we started talking about that, and we said, where is it? And he, said, he said, oh, yes, it's in the bulge of Africa. But I said, where exactly in the bulge? So we looked it up, and we saw this long list of African countries in the bulge, and we decided at that point that we're going to remember all the African countries there together with their capitals. And we came up, it was mostly his work, we came up with some sentence, some mnemonic device, which enabled us to remember it very easily. And he said, okay, now we're going to memorize all the world's nations together with their capitals. And we dropped our work for about three or four days, and we went through all the nations of the world, the old Soviet Union, the, all the nations there, and the hardest part was the Pacific nations, I remember. And in the end, we remembered everything. I don't remember a single one of these. It was always mnemonic devices, which he had come up with. And he, he was able to do this. I remember he had forgotten the, he knew pi to a thousand places for many years when, and he memorized them uh, with mnemonic devices. Uh, but uh, three or four years ago, he said, look, I only remember it now up to only about 300 places. And next week he had come up with a new mnemonic device, which allowed him to look at every 10 digits of pi and related to one of the elements in the periodic table. In this way, he remembered both the periodic table and also all the, all the expansion of pi to a thousand places. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Some wonderful stories there.